my name is Emily Ryan and I'm the Associate Director here at the Commons, uh, which is a space for launching and hosting questions and conversations that require broad, cross-disciplinary approaches and response. We are pleased today to welcome Wes Jackson, who epitomizes this sort of big thinking in response to the grand challenges we face. In addition to the Commons, there are a number of partners on campus who have helped make this event possible, including the Department of Visual Art, the School of the Arts, the Department of Sociology, the Environmental Studies Program, and the KU Biodiversity Institute and Natural History Museum, where there will be a reception following the talk, which is right across the street. To introduce Dr. Jackson, I'm pleased to introduce two professors who are instrumental in bringing West to KU today. Matt Burke, who is Associate Professor of Visual Art, and Paul Stock, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology and in the Environmental Studies Program. Matt Burke teaches sculpture, foundation, and drawings courses, as well as special topics, classes in wood and public art at the University of Kansas. His creative research ranges from the production of sculpture and drawing to large-scale, eco-based installations that integrate site, structure, and viewer. One such example of this was the Lawrence is the Lawrence-based neighborhood pocket libraries, which you have likely seen throughout the city. Paul Stock's research and teaching revolve around food, agriculture, sustainability, utopias, and morality, including work with organic farmers, New Zealand family farmers, and the Catholic worker movement's farms. Please welcome Matt and Paul. So just so you, I'm Matt and that's Paul. Thank, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for your patience. Uh, good evening and, and thank you for attending this uh, lecture tonight with uh, Wes and Joan in, in attendance. There's so many uh, uh, good or new friends and old friends that we've seen come and greet uh, Wes and Joan and it's been really wonderful to see. Hosting Wes Jackson under the auspices of the visual art lecture series is indicative of the change by which we're seeing isolated disciplines give way to interdisciplinary activity. Decades ago, pioneer land artist Dennis, Agnes Dennis said, artists must be dedicated to the future well-being of the ecological, social, and cultural life of this planet. Quite recently, California mixed media artist Frances Stark said she had, quote, seen artwork as a technology. I can look at a work of art of a deceased artist and see everything they meant and it can go into my brain. It's a magical technology. We have a lot to learn from each other's native intelligences and we each have a role to play in shaping and educating the future. Emily thanked everybody involved in bringing Wes here tonight, Wes and Joan, and I would reiterate that. And um, just uh, also would like to extend a special appreciation to my co-host, Paul Stock, for his, his vision and efforts tonight. Thank you, Matt. This is, uh, it's an honor to be a part of this evening, uh, to be able to bring Wes uh, back to campus, back to Lawrence. Um, I know that many of the people in this room have, have learned so much from him and his writings, the Land Institute, and the, the constant conversations that he's cultivated over the years. And tonight we have a, a new exhibition in this space called New Farmers. Um, which I'm very proud to be a part of in collaboration with uh, KU professor and photographer Brian Darby and designer Tim Hostler. And New Farmers at its heart is about place and people learning to become native to it. Unlike Tim, Brian and I are trying to learn what it means to be a Kansan. For the farmers pictured here, these are people trying to be what Wes has called homecomers. To be a homecomer means trying your very best to live, not necessarily where you're born, as Wes writes, but to go someplace and dig in and begin the long search and experiment to become native. To become native means to learn a respect for the community that you find yourself in, and that community is not just the chamber of commerce and the local restaurant, but the soils, the watersheds, and ecologies of place in communion with one another. A life like this, one that is good and decent, filled with responsibility to a community, is in the words of social critic Jacques Ellul, a life of extraordinary explosive force. We are happy to have Wes here to address that communion between agriculture and community this evening. 
<clears throat> Just by way of uh, familiarity, Wes Jackson is a founder and president of the Land Institute, and he's one of KU's own, receiving his MA in Botany in 1960, going on to get a, other degrees. His reputation precedes him, but here are a few highlights. He was a Pew Conservation Scholar in 1990, a, Mac a MacArthur Fellow in 1992, and received the Right Livelihood Award in 2000. Life Magazine included him as one of 18 individuals predicted to be among the 100 important Americans of the 20th century. Smithsonian in 2005 included him as one of the, quote, 35 who made a difference. He's written numerous books, including Nature as Measure, from which um, Paul's and my students have read and will be discussing with Wes tomorrow morning. Wes is here tonight in his last year as Land Institute President. Please join me in thanking Wes for his hard work and vision at the land and in welcoming him here this evening. Got to start, start off here with uh, turning this on. Does that do it? I hope that does it. Well, here we are. Uh, right here on Mount Orient uh, with the crimson and the blue. And um, I have to say it's an honor to, um, to be here. Um, with so many friends and others. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly two and a half years ago, I gave the commencement talk here at KU. And um, uh, here's part of what I told the class <clears throat> of 2013. A century and a half ago, only nine years before KU's first graduation, our nation was in the midst of a great civil war. The Declaration of Independence had declared that we were all created equal. That assertion has been called a high law of morality. On the other hand, our Constitution had one perilous flaw. Slavery was legal. America was both the land of the free and the land of the slave. And to complicate matters, each side believed that it was the legitimate heir of the American Revolution. <clears throat> With the higher law of morality, up against legality, the war came. Now, 152 years later, another high law of morality confronts us. A moral law not practiced because all of us exercise our legal authority. That high law of morality in our time calls on us to protect our planet's ecosphere, that miraculous skin surrounding the earth within which we're embedded, our soils, our waters, our forests, our prairies, our oceans, our agricultural fields, and now our atmosphere. Yes, there are too many of us, but our consumption is rapacious, and so, the high calling to protect our ecosphere has little legal standing. It is legal to rip the tops off mountains, get the coal and burn it. It's legal to drill for oil and natural gas from the Gulf to the Arctic and burn it. It is legal to engage in fracking that threatens groundwater, to get natural gas and burn it. It is legal for all of us to purchase unnecessary products made with extracted materials and fossil carbon. 
So it's legal, it's legal to bring on climate change, legal to bring on erratic weather and more. It is legal to be responsible for the loss of four-fifths of as much sea ice as we had in 1980. It is legal to have our soils erode and toxic chemicals applied, legal to allow our rural communities to decline and watch so much of our cultural seed stock disappear. And now we're forced to address the legality of explorations if we are to achieve the high law of morality to protect our ecosphere. I won't tell you how many negative letters I got from that commencement speech <laughs> and from what sector of the society they came from. A question for our time, though, is how do we address the law, high law of morality to protect our ecosphere when it is legal, and especially in industrial time, to destroy so much of what has sustained us over our evolutionary history? What if we begin with soil upon which we are so dependent for food? The food and agriculture, uh, the FAO of the United Nations has declared 2015 to be the International Year of Soils. Well, we all know that soil is more important than oil and as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. <clears throat> Add to that that land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases and that the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report has said that agriculture is the greatest threat to wild biodiversity. Now over the next few minutes, I wanna give you four ideas that I consider material to our future. Ideas that no politician will ever mention, even if any of these four are ever thought about. And I'm gonna go slow, and I'll pick up speed later. <clears throat> Number one, we're fundamentally ignorant. Billions of times more ignorant than knowledgeable. But living in a world assuming that knowledge is adequate, and knowledge is adequate worldview. Now, I wanna tell you a bit about the journey that led to that line of thinking. Hans Jenny, the greatest soil scientist of the last century at UC Berkeley, has a book called The Soil Resource. In that book uh, is a quote, and Wendell Berry wrote me a letter and quoted part of that soil resource. It went something like this, or it goes something like this. The rain message enters the forest canopy and through crown drip, leaf drip, stem flow, <clears throat> the rain message is transmitted downward to the forest floor where it leaves as it entered at random. Wendell then says, is Professor Yenny's use of the word random a verifiable observation or a limit of perception? If it indeed is a limit of perception, then we're up against mystery rather than knowledge. But to appropriate the language of science and assign it to the unknown is to do what the Greeks warned us against. It's hubris. So Wendell said perhaps he should have said the rain message goes from mystery through pattern back into mystery. 
Now, it's interesting that it took a poet to draw attention to that unscientific statement of Hans Jenning, which brings up something important, I think, for all of us to consider. And that is that the critique that is happening within our society now is the consequence of knowledge parked in its categories. And how are we to bring knowledge out of its categories? Well, one way is to feature questions that go beyond the available answers. And then the yeastiness that comes from not having an answer, that comes from acknowledging our ignorance, has the potential to give us an expansion of our considerations and maybe even solutions. Number two, aside from the fact that we're billions of times more ignorant than knowledgeable, uh, we did a book, there were some of the people in here that contributed to that volume. It's called The Virtues of Ignorance. We hosted a meeting in Matfield Green I had a banner across the street that said, welcome ignoramuses. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the idea was to explore the dimensions of knowledge and our ignorance. And we effectively said, since we are billions of times more ignorant than knowledgeable, let's go with our long suit and let's have an ignorance-based worldview. And that is something that I'm totally serious about. Now, number two, <clears throat> we have relied heavily on the use of systems theory, which too often fails us because systems theory is inherently reductive. Now, let's take some, some care. Imagine two gases hydrogen and oxygen. They come together and you get wetness or liquidity. The liquidity is an emergent property. A, back in 1950s, a man by the name of Feibelman looked at the laws of integrative levels, starting with atoms, then molecules, then cells, then tissues, then organs, then organisms. And he noted that associated with those 12 laws, well, that, those, that those, uh, 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 those structures within the hierarchy, he then formulated 12 laws. Biologists were saying, what comes next after organisms? And some said species, some said populations, and J. Stan Rowe, an ecologist, University of Saskatchewan, stepped back and said, what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common, he said, is contiguous volume. Species don't have contiguous volume. Populations don't have contiguous volume, ecosystems do. And so what Stan Rowe gave us was the volumetric criterion for thinghood. For something could be a thing, it has contiguous volume. Now, I want to come back to what this means in terms of reductive systems theory. The computers, even yet, John Holland worked on this for years. He just died the other day in his late 80s, University of Michigan. They cannot pick up emergent qualities. They can only take part here, part there, part there, part there, part there, and then we'll put together the interaction. So we live then in a world that is inherently reductive 
in the way we approach that world, and that goes back to 1600. That goes back to the time. Uh, well, we've already had Copernicus by then, but then there's Galileo, and then, of course, Francis Bacon, and Rene Descartes, and so on. Now, here's the point, lest I be under, misunderstood. There's nothing wrong with being reductive. The problem is to believe the world is like the method. So are we clear on that? But, so we now have two considerations that, <clears throat> that um, and I'll move on, brings us to number three. As members of complex societies, we live in a world in which there is often a counterintuitive behavior of the social systems we devise and put in place. Jay Forrester at MIT 40 years ago wrote a paper called The Counterintuitive Behavior of Social Systems. And he gave an example how you have a traffic problem, so you widen the road and you exacerbate the traffic problem. Or you need to get a road to go farther away from town, you pave it, and what you do then is exacerbate that problem, and so gridlock increases. In other words, if you tote up the total gridlocks, they are a consequence of sol trying to solve a problem. <clears throat> now, our question is, why is that so? Why is it so that we have this counterintuitive behavior associated with social systems? He gives other examples like housing. We need housing, put money into housing. We have more new houses, but then the capital is not available to fix up houses that could be fixed up. And so in terms of the total roof shed, there's actually less for people to live in. And then uh, sort of my favorite is the one, the fact that we live in a drug culture. Doesn't matter whether it's a legal drug store or an illegal drug store. It comes from the same source, the kind of advertising that this is going to make everything better, uh, or whatever your problem is better. And uh, so, uh, Essentially, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the advertisements are exacerbating the illegal drugs. Even though they're not mentioning them, it's essentially saying, here is a way to solve a problem. All right, that's the third. Number four, in a world of abundant carbon energy, we fail to recognize that the internal control of a system is usually more energy and materials efficient than the external control of a system. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Hopi corn has biological nitrogen fixation. We don't know if it's the endophytic, it's not the rhizobium uh, bacterium. Um, but it has. When you start looking around at the warm season grasses, most of the warm season grasses will leak sugar, and with that sugar, the endophytic bacteria will the the, the bacteria will uh, will will make nitrogen available. So what happened to us as we were selecting for high yield in our major crops? We tightened up on sugar leakage and allocated that to yield unwittingly. So in this world of the future, would it not be better to allow that sugar leakage to do the job in making the nitrogen available rather than go out and use the most important invention of the 20th century. Two Germans, 1909. Haber and Bosch learned how to turn atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. In so doing, what they did 
was, and what we do now, is use natural gas as the feedstock. Now get this. The rhizobium bacteria will do the job at four-fifths of one atmosphere at ambient temperature with 21 enzymes. Hubbard-Bosch is like 300 degrees and 400 atmospheres or the other way around, I don't remember, doesn't matter. So what we're talking about is efficiencies that are inherent within the natural integrities. And so the general law, rule, uh, I think is that the internal control of a system generally is more energy and materials efficient. So um, now I want to talk about ecosystems, nature's ecosystems, and why Nature's ecosystem should become a standard to counter the industrial mind and how an ecosystem takes care of all four of those considerations that I just uh, mentioned. So why do we take the ecosystem to be the conceptual tool in order to give us an ecological worldview in order to counter the industrial mind. Well, uh, Chris Field, Carnegie Institute of Washington and Stanford, an ecologist, published a paper in Science in 02, uh, following a survey of the planet's land-based ecosystems, and concluded that generally, natural ecosystems have greater net primary production than the human managed systems that follow. Nature does better at capturing sunlight and giving us what we'll call, for one of a better uh, expression right now, uh, net primary production. So in that sense, we can't beat nature. So if we embrace the ecosystem as a conceptual tool um, for not just agriculture and industry, but for the management of our resources generally, what can we expect? Now, I'm going to give you a brief account of the journey at the Land Institute, which I know a lot of you already know, but you got to hear it again. Um, <laughs> First, a little about the journey and tell you how it got started. In 1977, I was reading the General Accounting Office uh, a report on how efficiently the money was spent uh, by the Soil Conservation Service. And it looked to me in reading the report that soil erosion was about as bad in the 70s as when the Soil Conservation Service had been formed in the 30s. And I thought, my gosh, how can this be? Thousands of miles of terraces, glass waterways, you know, uh, no, an organization put together with great esprit de corps, from the stenographers to the PhDs in soil science. Uh, everybody's on board on this. Roosevelt's on board. Uh, and I read somewhere, and boy, if I could find it, if somebody will find it, I'll give them uh, $50. Um, <laughs> Actually, the land will pay for it, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I read somewhere that one-seventh of the total federal budget at one time in the 30s uh, was devoted to soil and water conservation. Now, that's easy to imagine if you consider that it's the CCC days, the Make Work projects, and so on. But even so, <laughs> so how can an organization <clears throat> How can an organization not stop the soil from eroding? I took some, I, I had interns back in those days, and I took them on a field trip to the Kanza Prairie. And there, you could see, um, here was a prairie, no soil erosion. 
it's the concept, oh Lloyd Hobart, uh, the late Lloyd Hobart uh, gave us a great tour. No soil erosion, no fossil fuel dependency. Um, with species diversity, you have chemical diversity, which means it takes a tremendous enzyme system on the part of an insect or a pathogen to give you the epidemic. Here was a system sponsoring its own nitrogen. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was represented with barbed wire, by barbed wire. So, and yet, here are our crops. Soil erosion, fossil fuel dependency, putting chemicals out there our tissues have no evolutionary experience with. Here's the contrast. That's what set me off. Well, thankfully, I had started out in plant taxonomy in Botany, in Snow Hall, uh, had, it's where my office was, the southeast corner on the second floor, on the Botany floor. I had the best spot on campus. And uh, what do taxonomists do? They create dichotomous keys, and they key things out. And so in thinking about that prairie, and our fields, it was on the back of a grocery sack. I drew a contrast between perennial and annual. Prairies of polyculture, our crops are monocultures. Polyculture, monoculture. Seed production versus vegetative, that is what we eat. Um, Herbaceous versus woody. And you do those four, in all combinations, it's a total of 16. Four of those are irrational. There's no such thing as a woody annual. But on the human inventory, all of the sensical blanks are filled except that one. And that is herbaceous, perennial seed-producing polycultures. It just blinked. So, as a consequence, uh, starting then, we began an inventory. Any plant that was herbaceous, perennial, we put in a five meter long row, and uh, we went out on the prairie. We have some native prairie, never been plowed, and we started sorting the, the, the prairie, no matter where it is, Canadian provinces or Kansas or Illinois or whatever, there are four functional groups, warm season grasses, cool season grasses, legumes, and members of the sunflower family. So we start sorting that out. And then sorting out the candidates that we thought could be high seed yielders, warm season, cool season, legume, sunflower, with the idea that we will breed those and then bring them together into a, um, uh, a creating a domestic prayer. Now, that was a long time ago that that started. And uh, David Van Tassel's working on sunflower and also has started work uh, sunflower uh, hybrids, perennials with, uh, with the annual. He also uh, is working on silphium, uh, which is, I think, going to beat sunflower. And um, Stan Cox, a perennial sorghum. His uh, perennial sorghum is now in Africa, and we have a postdoc from Uganda that's working on it. Uh, Lady Hahn is uh, working on the Kernza, which is intermediate wheat grass. He had been crossing that with wheat and uh, was responding to selection so well that that's really the first plant that is uh, now making flour out of and, and uh, farmers are growing it uh, in a very limited way and working with agronomists at University of Minnesota and elsewhere. And then Shu N. Wong is working on the perennial wheat and then we have uh, Feng Hui working on the perennial rice in China. Uh, we're supporting that. It's the upland rice that he's working on. Oh, that's Shu In uh, with the perennial wheat. And that's uh, 
uh, Fuing Hu. And Tim Cruz is our ecologist and the director of research. So this, is, this is, seems to be catching on. We have numerous connections around the world with various institutions. And uh, so now we're willing to talk about the institutionalization of the ecological paradigm. And uh, we can point to numerous faculty in various places around the globe, from Minnesota, University of Georgia, Texas A&M, South Dakota, Shuen's uh, perennial uh, wheat uh, hybrids are in eight different countries, 21 different sites, uh, St. Louis University, uh, University of Minnesota, Australia, Uganda, China, Mali, uh, Ethiopia. And the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council has endorsed uh, uh, the necessity for perennialism, so as the Royal Society, uh, the FAO, uh, has met and with our guys have met in Rome and also Mali and the World Bank has visited a couple of times. But the point I want to make is that we have, we have, we have this underway. Now, what is its larger meaning in terms of an ecological worldview? And I come back to my friend Chuck Washburn, the late Chuck Washburn who said, if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. That agriculture ultimately has a discipline that can stand behind it. The materials sector, the industrial sector has no discipline to stand behind it. Ecology and evolutionary biology are disciplines that we know about and that we've been knowing about for 150 years and putting knowledge mostly on the shelf. So, but I now want to tell you about something really exciting that uh, happened. This is, well, no, this is, you yeah, know, this is right down the middle of what I want us all to think about um, as we move along. We have always had this big question. Why did our ancestors not develop perennial grains? Why? Biologists were saying it's impossible because of a famous R and K selection idea, but here's what our guys have found. It's been published in two journals. One is Evolutionary Applications and the other is American Journal of Botany. But uh, three of our guys, Lee DeHaan, David Van Tassel, Stan Cox, uh, and this, this is what they, as a result of some Sherlock Holmes type effort, here's the story why our ancestors did not. My bet is it was tried every century many times. Why didn't it work? Well, annuals tend to self, except their own pollen. That is the tightest form of inbreeding. So imagine a mutant arises, a lethal mutant. Boom, out it goes quickly. Perennial, and if there's a desirable trait like resistance to shatter, it gets quickly fixed. Perennials tend to outcross. So let's imagine that all of us make a tribe and we're at the eastern end of the Mediterranean and we see what will become known as Thenopyram intermedium <laughs> someday after Linnaeus. This is 8,000 years ago, and we say, let's just take that seed off of that plant that looks to have so much promise, and we'll plant it out. Now they're all half sibs. We don't know where the pollen came from, but they're half sibs. We start crossing those half sibs, and that genetic load, that mutation load, and you end up with a whole bunch of aborted embryos. Well, in our time, we can purge that genetic load, partly because we can grow out thousands of plants, and we also have the modern computational power. And that's why that blank is there. And by the way, it's also the case with fruit trees and nut trees that are outcrossers. Most of that improvement comes not through the sexual cycle, but through the asexual cycle of the pruning 
you know, take a favorite branch that has shown up and you get it started. So, um, now this opens up uh, a tremendous opportunity. Why not develop a global inventory of any herbaceous, perennial, hard seed, well, without fleshy, from the tropics to the temperate zone? I was given a talk at St. Louis University in the Missouri Botanical Garden, and I put it out, they went nuts. They said, look, our computers are tied to all the major botanical gardens of the world and all the major herbaria. We can do that inventory. And so now that inventory is underway over a three-year period. It's a half-million-dollar project. And, um, so they're going to be looking at all the legumes, the oil seeds, and the grasses uh, from around the world. So I can imagine scores, if not hundreds, of graduate students and postdocs beginning to domesticate various wild candidates. I'm going to take that species and I'm going to bring it into the human inventory. I'm gonna take that one, I'm gonna take that one, I'll take that one. There'll be a lot of failures, but there'll also be some successes. Several times, President Thomas Jefferson wrote of the importance of new plants being added to our new country. He said this, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. And, get this, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture, especially a bread grain. Well, the idea that we can realistically imagine scores of new grains being added, you know the last time we had a major crop added to the human inventory? 3,500 years ago, cacao. So this discovery on the part of our group opens up so many opportunities because, I don't know if you know it or not, I hope you don't because I want to be able to tell you something. <laughs> um, what this means, and uh, forgive me, forgive me, we're adding new hardware in the perennial. In the, this new hardware, the perennial that'll be able to stay there and not have to be tearing the ground up every year, now means that ecology and evolutionary biology can come together with agriculture. And they've mostly been like this. There is agroecology, but I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings, but I'll tell you my opinion what agroecology is. It is what agronomists have been doing from the time of the Greeks and the Romans, and they find that certain things are ecological, so they assign ecology for these relatively minor things they do. And again, Agronomists, what are agronomists? Agronomists are people that we've had to have for this 10,000 year journey, but agronomists are mitigators of the consequence of disturbance. That's what we do to mitigate the consequence of disturbance. But now we're talking about the soil microbes, the soil invertebrates, being able to stay in place. And now ecologists will be able to work with the agronomists and begin to fashion a, an ecosystem that is as sustainable as the ecosystems we've destroyed. So we're talking about ecological intensification. And 
we can also realistically think about the end of soil erosion and the end of fossil fuel dependency and greatly reduced use of chemicals which, which we've not evolved. We can imagine more eyes to acres ratio and we imagine the farmer of the future working with herbaceous perennial seed producing polycultures as a kind of a domestic prairie will have a psychology more like that of a 19th century British naturalist and ecologist than the modern day farmer that was condemned in the Genesis story to thistles and thorns and sweat of the brow. Tim Cruz has been thinking about and looking back over time and if you imagine a pie and you, the pie represents human activity for 10,000 years and you make little pieces cut out of that pie, what would be the biggest piece of activity for humans that would characterize humans as to who they are over our agricultural history? Weeding. <laughs> We're weeders. That is a rich insight of his. And when you, it's one of those that you think, of course, why didn't I think of that? And so the condemnation in the Genesis version of thistles and thorns and sweat of the brow, they didn't like it. If we were meant to be farmers, we'd have had longer arms. We're creatures of the upper Paleolithic. We came off that savanna. And because we got more calories out of those annual grains, then we have more people. And as awful as it is to have to deal with thistles and thorns and sweat of the brow, we do it because we love kids more than we hate work. So the question is, I think we have the potential for a new set of metaphors to replace our industrial language. So let's come back to those four big challenges for society that I mentioned from the beginning. Every one of them is handled in one stroke with this ecological worldview. I'll go through it again. With agriculture, we can now remain ignorant about the processes which came from mimicking nature to return and take care of us. Those processes will return to the soils, to the field. That prairie which we are mimicking to some degree, that prairie has answers to questions we've not yet learned to ask. Should we not expect a similar response when the principles of these ecosystems are applied to the society level? Let's pull those principles out. And what does that mean in terms of organizing cities, in organizing our farmstead, in organizing our way of doing the business on this, this globe? Number two, system theory use is limited because of the reductive nature failing to reveal all of the emergent properties. Why do you say that again? System theory use is limited because of its reductive nature and failing to reveal all of the emergent properties. When farming like a prairie, most of the emergent processes return. Why should we not expect some similar response when the principles are applied to the society level? Number three, the counterintuitive behavior of social systems. Many of our social systems designed by us have the opposite effect. The prairie solves for pattern. And 
So should we not expect some similar response when the principles are applied to the society level? And four, the internal control of a system is more energy and materials efficient than the external control, well, sugar leakage, rhizobium bacteria, 21 enzymes, information rich, not much energy in order to bring the coherence. So should we not expect some similar response when the principles are applied to the society level? Okay, I'm going to end with a Gary Schneider poem. And it appears at the end of his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Turtle Island. It's called For the Children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century or the one beyond that, they say our valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Here's a problem. We at the Land Institute have lots of pickup trucks. We have greenhouse. We've got computers. We run around the country and the world. The technology that is making possible both the hybrids and the domestication of the wild perennials, will all that technology used to bring these new species and varieties into existence be required on the other side of what Gary Snyder's talking about? Will it be required? And I say the answer is no. Their creatureliness will make them available even to a Neolithic farmer. And a word of caution as we think of extending the ecosystem concept to an industrial world, the industrial world can't make that claim. Priuses, squiggly light bulbs, efficiencies here and there. How much of that is dependent upon the scaffolding of civilization that's been put there with a lot of highly dense carbon. And it too is subject to the second law. So that's the, that's the word of caution. So we've answered two old religious questions. Where'd we come from? We're stardust, products of the simian line. We're mammals. Uh, we're, we're land organisms and so on. That's the kind of a thing we are. And we don't know the answer to the third question, what's to become of us? But when it comes to transforming the industrial world, in one sense, we're like Dante, entering a dark world. There's neither map nor guide. Dante had Virgil for the trip through hell. In our time, we're all hoping to avoid several kinds of hell as we make our way through the woods. Or if you prefer, maybe there, we're entering it more desert-like, but with no Moses or commandments in stone. But it matters but little that we have neither map nor guide. We have something better. We have affection for our ecosphere, an emergent property in our brain, and the will to negotiate a corrective course. We have our institutions, our schools, colleges, universities, nonprofits, even government to transform and use. And I'm proud to say that we have a relationship with the University of Kansas. And we have some property donated by 
uh, Jim and Cindy Haynes, which we have sold to the Malone Family Foundation, but with the idea that we can buy it back any time in 15 years. We've got a presence here, and we're the presence of the folks in ecology, evolutionary biology, environmental studies, <clears throat> and now what I hope to do is expand the idea ecospheric studies because agriculture, science, is within a dominating social organization and we should not presume that we can have a satellite of sustainability orbiting the extractive economy. We've got to start talking about the necessity to end economic growth and go negative as we work to figure out how we meet bona fide human needs. And that's going to be tough. But we've got to say it out loud. Evolutionary biologists and ecologists know about the nature of cycling, of throughput, of decay, response, and so on. We got to get in tune with that way of being. So agriculture and the formal culture have historically stood behind cultural advances and declines, but so has for all practical services, purposes non-renewable carbon. And it hasn't mattered whether the operating system of ideas features gods or God, the divine right of kings, private property, or universal human rights, as land animals, our land-based dependency is always in the thinking. And now we can imagine protecting it. The fall, what the biblical fall began with agriculture when we partook of the tree of knowledge. And by embracing this, and you remember, and driven from the garden and the great myth, the angel with the flaming sword denies access to the tree of life. But by combining the ecosystem concept, we're embracing the tree of life. So the legal family matches the, the, the legal can finally match the high moral to protect our ecosphere. Since agriculture began 10,000 years ago, we've been rampant colonists. That journey can and must end as we realize that this is our home and must treat it as such. And so in the words of T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started, but know the place for the first time. That's the great possibility, to know the place for the first time and be able to act on our knowledge of ecology and evolutionary biology and beginning with agriculture as the source of metaphors for the rest of society. Thank you. Two quick questions and an assertion for you to respond to. The first question is, what is the relationship of your perennial um, plains agriculture to something like um, uh, Mark Shepard's restoration agriculture, which is tree-based permaculture for farmers? Um, so is, is, are they complementary, basically, like his is oak savanna supporting big animals, and yours, when it's uh, deployed in a, de in a decade, will be the prairie approach? Sure. It you got perennials in place. You're not disrupting your systems uh, through plowing and hoeing and this, that, and the other. So uh, the, the reason that we're working on grains is that about 70% of our calories 
come from grains grown on about 70% of the acreage. And so most of the, 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 um, um, the um, uh, United Nations FAO says that we're losing about 30 million acres a year due to land degradation, and most of that has to do with grain monoculture. And also, as you know, it's uh, land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases. So if you get those perennials in there, then you're not going to have that kind of loss. And what is the complementary relationship with someone like David Yarrow's concept of geotherapy, uh, healing the soils through applying long-term carbon biochar with widespread mineralization and biological inoculation? And he calls the end result cool food, where it's carbon effective and uh, nutrient dense. Well, <clears throat> I poo-pooed that for a while. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, like so many things I've predicted uh, and poo-pooed, I then have to soften. And I've softened on the uh, biochar because Tim Cruz, our ecologist, is, uh, has been looking at that very closely and thinks that there is far greater potential than I thought. I thought it was going to be restricted to the tropics and that... Uh, you know, it's the consequence of char that has accumulated over a long time, and that uh, to get those huge yields out of a rather small area was not going to scale up and deal with the kind of scale that uh, we're particularly interested in. But it turns out, according to Tim, that it has... <clears throat> and Look, I don't have a mind of my own. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't sound like according that. According to Tim, that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't agree so fast. <laughs> I mean, be a little more kind to me now. Uh, but, uh, but apparently there's something to it. But I haven't looked into it the depth that he has. And then my assertion for you to respond to is that in terms of your uh, assertion that we're fundamentally ignorant as a part of the yeah. impossibility of knowing all and not being able to understand complex systems, is it also the fact that we, that which we do know has been in large part occulted or per, per, we've, been per, we've been purposefully deceived by the folks that don't want this system to change. And the problem is not that we have too many people, is that we have too, too uh, few people controlling the large portion of people, and that our problem is that we have a uh, weaponized politics of deception that occults such things as ongoing geoengineering, weather control. You said it's uh, legal to, uh, you know, change the weather, but it's illegal to actually uh, do what they're doing, which is spraying barium and aluminum and strontium all around the world. And, you know, in order for there to be a chance for your important work to take hold, we're going to have to stop that. And so I propose instead of a weaponized politics of deception that we have a transcendent politics of the radical middle that pushes forward uh, a platform for an, a creative American renaissance. But you said we will finally know this place. And I think people have known this place for a long time. And I don't know if we've really paid attention to those people. Native peoples, for example. Have we parsed their sentences so we understand what they have said in the past? Have we just been playing with our toys so much and allowing their knowledge to degrade like the soils have degraded so that we no longer have a way to connect with that knowledge that was there before. Well, of course, before we started plowing and hoeing, uh, people were more or less in tune. They weren't ripping the tops off mountains. They weren't drilling in the Arctic. They weren't doing any of that. But I will say this, that without coal, we would have never had Charles Darwin. Without coal and probably oil, probably wouldn't have had Einstein. Without either of those, we would have probably never known or stardust. We would not have known of our journey 
as the journey work of the stars and then the journey here as a carbon-based <laughs> set of creatures. Uh, so, but the damning thing will be if we don't take that knowledge that came at a huge cost and be corrective. This is why, you know, in, in that, I mean, it, it was brilliant. That Genesis version was brilliant. It's too bad that it's, uh, it's, it's interpreted uh, in a way that's not my way. Uh, <laughs> but it's brilliant because uh, there was the the outright commandment, don't partake of the tree of knowledge. And they did. And then they were driven from the garden and said, and the angel with the flaming sword denied access to the tree of life. I think what we're doing in our time is approaching the angel with the flaming sword and saying, we're going to make this pact. From now on, the tree of life will be superior and the tree of knowledge will be subordinate. And the priesthood has to be ecologists and so forth that know when we're getting out of line. Now, there's too much water has gone through the turbines to give up on the tree of, of uh, knowledge. That's, as I see it, the problem at seven billion and counting. And that is part of the big problem, but so is the throughput. So it's, if we can get our minds wrapped around what it would mean to, be, to have an ecological worldview that would inform our arts, our humanities, our science, all of that, and make it legitimate to feature questions that don't have answers, then we will be driving that knowledge out of its categories that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, so, <laughs> the, the thing is, will we, well, here's, I'll just tell you my worry. It's what I call the 3.45 billion year old imperative. We're all carbon based and we go after energy rich carbon. Bacteria on a petri dish goes after sugar. Drosophila flies in a flask <laughs> with yeast and bananas. They just go for it. Deer without predators and we have built an economic system to go after it. It's called the growth economy, but it's nothing more than petri dish economics. And now and then we get upset because some people are getting a lot more than others, moving faster on the petri dish. And so we put in some policy, but that's so we can hit the edge of the petri dish at the same time. We're not addressing the problem of growth. That's what we've got to be grown-ups about. Because the human crop can wither like any other. And so it's been a beautiful run. You know, it's been a beautiful run. And we got a lot of science, we got a lot of technology, we got a lot of, out of the humanities, we got a lot out of the arts. Let's bring them together. Uh, as, as one. There is no them and us. Uh, we're all in it together. Yeah. Oh, there's a, okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, Thank Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, a 
the beginning of the, before you talked, you were introduced, um, we were informed that you're possibly going to retire from the land institute. I'm not going to quit being president. Okay. I'm going to stay on salary. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is really kind of building on this talk and also what John Cobb talked about at yeah. the Prairie Festival yeah. um, and just that, the whole idea of shifting the scientific paradigm and including you know more more disciplines and bringing the arts in bringing all those other elements in when when you envisage the future of the land institute s say for example the bag of money was to fall from the sky what would your utopian kind of idea be of of the organization in terms of where it would be where it will end up in 100 years from now if if we're successful in bringing together different disciplines. Y'all hear that question? Really, I'm, I'm asking, what, what's your vision? What's your dream for the Land Institute? If, if it could possibly manifest in 100 years from now, what would the Land Institute look like? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you that most of my major predictions over the last 50 years have been wrong. I had no idea we would feed 7 billion. I thought we would have nuclear war by now. I mean, there in Salina, the jets were lined up with nuclear weapons and we had missile bases all around. I saw no way out. Now I realize it's not over, we still have a lot of nuclear, but it hasn't happened yet. And we're still feeding seven plus billion. Well, we all know, we all know that a lot of them aren't fed. But to, look, here's what we can imagine. We can imagine that if we can save our soils, we can get through this long, dark tunnel. We don't know what climate's going to do. It, the modelers, and by the way, they're reductive. <laughs> they don't account for all the emergent properties, but that's the best knowledge, information we have, are saying that west of Salina it's going to be drier and east of Salina it's going to be wetter. So we can't predict. But let's say that we are able to keep on keeping on. And what will we be doing? I think that we will be getting more people on the landscape. Because what we know about the way sunlight falls across an area, that it's dispersed. And what we know is that life forms trees and other things concentrate carbon. And so the ratio of the concentrators to the concentrate ease, uh, there's going to be more of those and less of this moving around. I'm hoping that the Land Institute can be a part of that intellectual journey in which the research continues and that the imagine the bison out on the prairie and fire and grazing. Imagine the domestic bovine on herbaceous perennial seed producing polycultures being managed by domestic bovines, fire and grazing. I'm imagining that, and that in a certain sense, there will be, there will not be the kind of frenetic world that we're currently living in, but that community will begin to be the important big idea. Community, communion, communitas, and the reward for destroyed 
community, communion, communitas has historically been power. And that is the dismemberment that we got to be healing. And we can do that. We can do that. We can do that.